It's all Can good. everyone see my screen? Okay, so I'm going to start the uh, slideshow now. There we go. So today um, I'm going to talk about drone futures, mapping UA UAS applications and research and talk about futures in general and talk about uh, implications for practice. So I'm going to move through about three themes. I'm going to move through, through fairly casually um, and uh, bring so loads of different projects together. There's a couple of videos that I hope will work today. Um, if they don't, you can just look at the links of this PowerPoint afterwards and just follow them up because they're really beautiful works and, uh, and yeah, and, and go from there. Um, it's took a while to get to this, uh, to do this. I think uh, I'm, I'm really interested in um, what's coming up, what's forthcoming in terms of what landscape architecture is, what landscape planning is, and its relationship with the built environment. Things that really sort of have got on my wick <laughs> and slightly is, uh, and, and spurred me on to do this work is things like the Iowa State Manifesto for landscape architecture, which was really provocative uh, polemic um, uh, and just said, landscape architecture can't do this, it can't do that, it's failed. The history is linked to 18th century romanticism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I sort of wanted to look at where we're heading and where we're going. And, um, and that's why I started to work. So um, I'm part of Imagination Lancaster and uh, we're an open led research lab in the UK. So we are working in a post-disciplinary way. So our, our staff of 44 uh, researchers um, are from product design, architecture, architectural technology, uh, planning, behavioral science, and we work in a really flat and dynamic way and uh, are, f are sort of constructed as a research lab in terms of these clusters, which is home and living, community and the public sector, factory and workplace, city and urban, population and policy, and uh, other themes, health, sustainability, international, uh, international practice and prosperity. We also have uh, campuses in China, Malaysia and Ghana and um, our particular um, baby throwing a rattle out of the pram moment, i.e. Brexit, uh, means that we've also got a campus in, in Germany, in Leipzig. Um, so we're, we still remain and have an international outlook uh, going forward. It's a really interesting place to work because you are faced with very different approaches, uh, very different practices, and, and um, uh, it's really refreshing to, to work outside the normal silos of, of disciplines, um, which I think is exciting. So uh, yeah, um, as Nadia said, that's me. Um, there's some bits I've done, etc. More importantly, um, why do I do it? Uh, because I I love ultra running and I love pizza, and they're absolutely joined together. Um, uh, and I'm training for the Ultra Trail Mont Blanc at the moment, uh, which is a major race uh, in, in France, Italy, and Switzerland. Um, so ultra running is just taking trails or going uh, beyond a marathon distance. And it's a great way to see the landscape actually. Um, and you guys, I'm sure I've got some amazing trails over there. I'm waiting for my invite post COVID, um, but there we go. And so this is what I'm talking about today. This is the talk thesis. So really what I'd like to think about and what I'm saying in this PowerPoint, if I'm, if, if you, if I'm rambling on for this whole session, just come back to this PowerPoint slide and say that this is what he's actually said, rather than his terrible jokes or blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to think about how we're our futures, what futures we have and how they're constructed. We need to think about new mobilities for landscape that are present. We need to think about the use of unmanned aircraft systems, or we can call that drones. Um, and uh, UAS is the term I use, um, and I'll, I'll say why I do. And the new mapping and practice implications that drones can bring. And I think that's really refreshing to 
landscape representation and uh, practice and implementation as well. And I'd also like to get us to consider about the mobilities and relationship with rural planning, actually, because there's some exciting things happening here in terms of these general futures. So overall, we're going to think about futures. We're going to think about some of the new mobilities for landscape, some mapping and practice implications, and uh, the, the potentials for mobilities and rural planning. OK, that's a thumb up moment. I'll take that. Thanks. OK, so uh, futures. Uh, we, we can think about futures in all sorts of different According ways. According to Paul Clay, the drawing really good. is simply. Um, Stephen Ward, in A History of Planning in the 20th Century, states that the most successful cities are being characterized by two uh, uh, ways. And uh, he, he's, uh, he says the first and most fundamental is invention meaning the discovery of new ideas with far-reaching potential. The second is innovation proper, whereby new ideas are adapted, packaged and applied in practical ways. And I think landscape architecture can do that a lot of the time um, in terms of invention, but really I think it's about invention proper, where we take existing ideas about space and place and we apply them in very different ways and we find new sort of knowledge in that in that application and that's and that's really interesting so innovation is speculation we're all innovating in a way in terms of our design studios now right i hope um in practice uh, we're trying to we're trying to do some something different but um this is an example of a back to the future hoverboard <laughs> great idea of a future and if we look back and step back in a very uh, simplistic way the hoverboard started with a sketch by john bell an industrial designer he did a sketch of this hoverboard for mattel and it got realized in a film and it has such a massive uh, popular culture impact that then companies would start kickstarter campaigns and there was a need to invent it we have to have a hoverboard. That's something we have to, we need it right now. Without, you know, forget climate change, we need a hoverboard. That's the most important thing. Um, and so I think we can, we can look at the history of landscape architecture and within the built environment history overall, and we can find periods of innovation. And that's really important that we can map those and think about them and, and see them as speculation and their impact on the built environment. So we could think about a Humphrey Repton sketch, you know, the flappy sketch, the before and the after. He shows it to a client and that would be radical. It wasn't it, that, 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 that sort of device, that pictorial device would have a massive impact in landscape gardening in the UK particularly. Um, so there's always innovation and speculation that you can find. And I found through my teaching and probably some of the faculty would hopefully agree that, uh, um, but know from experience as a student, it can be hard to see contextual studies and practice as uh, it, um, together and joins. And actually they're fundamentally joined in terms of where you're developing in your work. Um, your the studio and your and your contextual study should be really integral because your ideas don't arrive in a vacuum you can't make a future you're borrowing from something else in, in order to project it forward so we need to think about our types of innovation that you're doing as students and um, where you're getting those points um, of development and um, and really how you speculate can have a massive impact some of you are only drawing at the moment, right? You're not, you're not realizing a built form, but your drawings, your representation, your designs, your scheme has a, a, a real potential uh, in the future. And you should, you should hold on to that because that's just like that back to the future hoverboard sketch. You, it can have such a power and impact and that's really important. So that, yeah, let's, let's go forward. Um, this is uh, some of the work from a government report we did and uh, uh, called a visual history of the future in 2014. If you just uh, look at that, uh, it's a free report, a free PDF. Um, 
and we evaluated over a thousand visions. So uh, um, visions of the built environment from practice and uh, students and all uh, and many different uh, um, media forms. And we created a taxonomy of meaning. Um, and to summarize, we uh, created these dominant paradigms. So the way people image are making images what are they trying to communicate with those images and we found that there were particular in our paradigms that there were particular um, peaks and troughs in terms of those visualizations so if i pull one out particularly on the right hand side you can see on the second parad dominant paradigm down it says ecological cities so we can start to see um, a number of visualizations, contemporary visualizations and, and design schemes, which are looking at climactic challenges using green infrastructure, thinking about landscape in a really new and dynamic way. I know there's accusations of greenwash, et cetera, and all that sort of thing in these visualizations, but we can see there's like a new concern arriving in terms of how people um, what what what's what's the basis of their ideas we can see a continuation of like a regulated city or zoning or grid city um our, our layered city and so we can put in lots of our visions and put them in this taxonomy which is very loose and start to think um what sort of future do uh, do we see perceive where are we heading um it's a useful device it's a very loose device and open to criticism but um it, it's quite an interesting way of evaluating projects and putting them those in a much larger uh, larger uh, period of history and so in the new book um uh, uh future cities the visual guide again we continued that scheme but we opened it out into a global context rather than the smaller UK based foresight um, from the original government report. So we can see all sorts of, of stuff uh, emerging. And one of the most pervasive, for example, has been the garden city. Everyone pulls out Ebenezer Howard's diagram as, as, as the solution for sort of modern <laughs> planning or, or a basis to start from. And I don't know why the UK is fascinated by garden city form. Um, it's pervasive, it's, uh, it's, it's weird. Um, uh, it was radical at the time and it was part of the um, uh, um, uh, um, RTPI. So the, uh, uh, um, it helped town planning, the formation of town, the professional town planning bodies, et cetera. But we can see these forms repeat and why they're repeating is really interesting to look at. So futures, you're sort of trying to map where you're going. So don't forget to look back if you're going to look forward. If you're presenting a scheme of where we're going, perhaps those historical points can really inform your, your design practice. And part of that overall sort of according features. to paul clee oh, the drawing oh, oh that's wrong <laughs> um uh, gosh um let me step back there we go um part of that futures work was looking at our potential um in landscape in terms of drones uh so i began this work 2015 uh 16 i went through uh um my uh, uh, drone registration, commercial flights uh, um, registration here in, in, in the UK. I also wrote a technical guidance note for the Landscape Institute, which is the UK professional body for landscape architects. And that's in currently being updated. Um, with the drone book, there were two separate sides. One was a very legislation heavy um, uh, uh, technical note. Which, which which I produced and the drone book more looks at a broader um, uh, futures because if you write a book about legislation it's dead within three months <laughs> before it hits the ground because <laughs> this this environment is changing so fast as you can see um, it's so exciting uh, um, uh, I really see a potential for landscape architecture 
to find a voice in a broad in the broader built environment which is, has been a long concern but to find new ways of presenting uh, um, our schemes and also to uh, fight against climate change and all sorts of environmental issues preservation conservation etc so um, this is uh, for those who are really uh, nerdish and super cool. This is an extract from Byte magazine, the computer journal, systems journal from 1979, a very good year, which was looking at early um, world modeling on a computer uh, with probably about 10 bytes hard drive or something ridiculous. Um, uh, and uh, next to it, um, this Cartesian system draped over a world. How can you make a map was a, was a particular problem. And it's part of uh, the late John Uri's quotation about mobility is about our, 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 our need to map the world. And he says, there is the mo in the model world an accumulation of movement analogous to the accumulation of capital repetitive movement or circulation made possible by diverse interdependent systems of movement. The human mastery over nature was effectively achieved through movement over, under and across it. So fundamentally, your desk based was research starts with a map. You start with a map to, to work out your scheme. Part of that mapping process involves movement. So we've ma mastered landscape through mo mobility and through mapping. And that's where we start as a basis in landscape architecture. And that's where I think it's always fundamental to return to. We can start to see movement appear in the most commonly known architectural tropes and schemes. Actually, when we talk about Le Corbusier, and I'll only talk about him briefly because everyone talks about Le Corbusier at some point, um, uh, we can see actually Le Corbusier's practice was fundamentally about new possibilities in the air. He wrote a book called Aircraft <laughs> and was, <laughs> was fascinated um, and in developing urban planning through his journeys flying across uh, the world. He, he writes about that topographical view of sp space and the failure of cities. And um, we can also uh, see, we can see that in Mario Zampini's illustration of Le Corbusier's idea about this. Uh, and we can see that uh, aerial mobility present in Cam's uh, uh, um, collective uh, in the CAM collective group. But we can also see the mobilities appear in Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is completely forgotten. Everyone talks about Broadacre City, but actually, how do you travel across Broadacre City? And you've got these weird helicopters that Frank Lloyd Wright draws. <laughs> so these little aerial spinners, these new little mobilities that arrive in these schemes, this sort of agri pastoral vision needs an, a new mobility in order to, for that scheme to work. It's not just about cars and Futurama and the Bel Geddes work in a way, but it's also about these aerial vehicles and spinners that, that appear. So it's been really sort of teasing out what's happening in these, in these uh, visions and, uh, and why are they so interested in this new mobility, this, uh, this aerial perspective over, uh, of, 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 of landscape and cities and urban place. Again, um, back in the day, <laughs> when I started this, when I started uh, uh, my PhD, I mean, James Corn has been really interesting for me when he was writing uh, Recovering Landscape and he was talking about drawing and idiotic map mapping. Um, we uh, we can uh, he's made these wonderful collage uh, schemes, and we can see uh, we should all know the book "Taking Measures Across the American Landscape." Absolutely fantastic book, but we forget that 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 quite critical moment was also about his work collaborating across with with cultural geographers, so working with Don Dennis Cosgrove. And, and you can see the, uh, the full, uh, some of the essays uh, by Dennis Cosgrove. And you can also see what makes that collective 
project really exciting is his work with Alex uh, S. McLean, which is a, a really interesting American photographer and his uh, aerial photography. So um, ask, ask, ask Alex McLean whether he uses drones and he gets quite annoyed. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> um, he, he he has has his pilot's license and his micro light license and uh takes helicopter journeys and all the rest so um you know the this that 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 book on my shelf to the right is is uh, and uh, james corner's essays and collages and composites really why i started thinking okay actually if i'm getting to the base of it in landscape practice mapping our design schemes our plans are derived from maps and our schemes derived from plans and our visualizations perspectives aerial perspectives all sort of follow that's the common you know that's the common thread if you're exciting and you, and you think screw this i'm just going to do it in a completely different way good that's really good we should always upset the balance i'm probably talking about like a common uh, approach to developing some design work. We can also start to see that actually the aerial provides a new knowledge. So there's an aerial ontology here. Um, just for Le Corbusier, um, being present in the air provided a new way for him to conceive of, um, of urban planning. We can also see Th that the aerial reveals some of the most harshest of realities about our world. So in here, um, Johnny Miller's Unequal Scenes, we can see a development in Kaya Sands and a slum town to the east uh, of Bloodsbrod in the city of Johannesburg. We don't, we don't know this knowledge unless we take a, a aerial view of it. That, that street level uh, observation is lost, but then we can see in the failures of planning in this case, um, fundamentally. Just as the aerial ontology reveals about our environmental change dramatically. So one of the most exciting uh, photographers out there is Tom Hagen. I should, I really suggest having a look at his work. Um, uh, some of these photographers I gathered for the book through Instagram and stuff, which was really weird um, because I'm, I'm not really an Instagram person and contacting these people, they were like, who are you? I just, you're, are you like 50? Do you know how to use this platform? Um, <laughs> but eventually I won them over and it was really interesting talking to them about how, they, how they're framing uh, their photography and what are they trying to look at. And so we can see coal mining uh, scheme here in Germany lignate mining so does groundwater lowered minerals um, come into contact with oxygen and water make these wonderful brownish orangish hues but it also shows wow this is this is our landscape right this is our this is the reality of our landscape that we have at the moment and the aerial ontology is fundamental if we're going to tell a different narrative or a different future Again, to look at our visualizations, I love Grant Associates' work, Gardens by the Bay, iconic scheme, beautiful visualization. It's got everything. It's got the it's got the neon jazz. It's 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 got our uh, wonderful uh, wonderful color scheme, purples, yellows, blues, beautiful visualizations. But this is the reality on the left, which I call uh, well, Finbar calls uh, Gardens by the Haze. This is this is this is this is Singapore, right? Um, sorry, Dan. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Can I keep talking now, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, my my daughter's just showed me some Lego. Um, she's built a beautiful house, right? Um, so this is Gardens by the Haze, um, uh, and actually, we're talking not just as landscape architects. We're making these quite large schemes here leading um uh, uh but there are ma massive larger environmental problems going forward so um what do we do about it and how does the aerial reveal the our realities of our spaces so someone which i've looked at for um 
a while and that video is not going to work i think is um uh, oh it may uh, this is gab 707 he's the best drone pilot in the world and he's won the drone racing league uh, but he, he's also worked with universities and, done, and meteorologists and all the, all the rest. So this is first person perspective drone flight. So you put on a goggle and this is what you see as you move through space. He's also beat a drone AI racer as well. <laughs> um, uh, that was uh, built from a Lockheed Martin uh, competition. This is a bit, uh, it's a bit, it's not in the afternoon for you guys to fall asleep yet, so <laughs> I hope you can hear the piano on your systems at home. <laughs> but actually, this is on narration of, of place, which I'd like to just point out, that drones allows them to narrate a place. They provide an aerial ontology, an overview of the space, just like a static map or plan do. So are we using them? How can we use them? And uh, what sort of narration are we going to say about our spaces? So fast forward a bit. There we go. Um, uh, I'm part of the World Eco Economic Forma Forum, which is, uh, is, is uh, meets in Davos. And uh, this is the economic uh, uh, transitions map about our potentials for drones in, in our futures. So drones need to be integrated in airspace management and infrastructure. They're gonna be part of logistics and delivery. They have whole new potentials in AI and machine learning, which we'll talk about shortly. A new potential in aerial data capture policy and social impact what we're going to do when we we sort of do have you ubiqu ubiquitous drones around us um, uh, um urban aerial mobility so uam it's called um so our new um delivery vehicles but our own personal flying vehicles and uber air taxis are right upon us actually and that's quite scary it's a it's a very near future than we actually perceive and our particular use here today is the is is um one of the earlier adopters of drone uses which actually from ecologists and uh the ability of ecologists and landscape to and planning to use drones in environmental present preservation so so i'm i'm looking at this a very a few years ago looking at James Corner's book, uh, Taking Measures Across the American Landscape, and that's like, wow, why aren't we doing it, right? <laughs> what, why aren't we using these tools and techniques in, what, in, 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 uh, in this profession? Because we've, we've, we've done lots of speculation, we've done lots of innovation before looking at a broader history. So why is it not happening now? Um, so uh, we can see in price uh, PwC report global market for drone usage is valued over 127 billion with 45 billion of that value in the infrastructure sector. We can see a McKinsey report, uh, it's always McKinsey. Commercial drones are here, say that by 2026, corporate and consumer applications in the US will have an annual impact of 31 billion to 46 billion on the, com on the country's GDP. So this is a massive market through aerospace um, development and innovation that could be really, really radical for the built environment in particular as a spin-off. We forget, again, our history is our future. So the first drone is actually a pigeon. <laughs> so this is Nicholas Nubrona, a pigeon mounted with a small camera. So it provides some of the, the earliest aerial views, apart from balloon flights, which is a different history. So the, there's the first aerial view was took in uh, uh, Paris by Nadir, a photographer. And he also did the first underground uh, photographs as well. Um, 
but this is a, a our first drone, a pigeon with a camera attached. It would take random timed pictures of the urban environment. It, and you'd get the wings in it, but it'd just provide this aerial perspective that the military thought would be absolutely critical to get a view over, over uh, to uh, survey um, uh, uh, countries and systems. Fast forward, go to China, and now you can you have a, a surveillance drone, which is a robotic pigeon that flies in a swarm that uh, that can monitor um, the public. So look at that period of history, you know, in uh, um, uh, 100 years, 101 years, and you have exactly the same thing. And that's really uh, interesting. Going forward, we can find uh, drones becoming the new firework. So ubiquitous system. So they all fly as a system here. At, uh, this is at the Franchise Freedom event and by a company called Studio Drift. We can find quite scary uh, technology. I don't know if this is gonna work, oops, no. But uh, in this slide here, um, which, you, which I'll supply afterwards and you, you can play, each drone communicates to another and flies in a swarm. So they all know what to do. And if they see a hazard in red, they can avoid it. So we're seeing swarms of drones used in for festivals just, just because we can. <laughs> we can also see our major corporates developing and, and, and delivering design patents for drones and delivery blimps. And we can see a really scary future emerging. So here, these are uh, uh, patents um, are in figure three, were developed by Amazon. And then this video appeared on Twitter. I'm much better at Twitter than I am Instagram. Um, and people uh, saw these uh, visions, as you see on the top. And they were like, wow, Amazon have actually made these blimps because they look like the real Lockheed Martin blimps. And they were like, they're here, they've, they've done it. They, this is their secret testing ground. But actually it was a CGI artist from Japan that just spoofed loads of people and tricked them. <laughs> so, and you know, the, the power of a visualization, but people are expecting this to happen, right? We're, we're like, we're accepting this future, which is really bizarre. And, and, it, and, you, and you think, okay, delivery blimps, where have I seen that one before? Oh, Archigram. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, let's go to Instant City. Um, actually, uh, uh, all these visions, all these architectural landscape visions, let's own up to it. We've, we've provided this, these corporate monoliths with, with the practical tools to deliver an urban system. <laughs> and we can see that in Instant City, this, this giant Skynet blimp that would drop a theater down and performance center and then just fly away. Or we can see it as a as a in a in a um, a flood system from Cloud City, so everyone would have their own blimp and it would just pull your house up when you'd live there in a in an emergency shelter for a while. And we can see these visions emerging. Um, if you've got to talk about aerial vehicles and drones, you've got to talk about Blade Runner, and you just do it very quickly, as I'm going to do here. And um, we can see that power of the sketch again by Sid Mead on the right. And Sid Mead's uh, inspired by LA on the left. <laughs> this is LA, but it looks like a clip from Blade Runner, right? It's really bizarre. This sort of fog system, this whole, this design inspiration, this is where it's come from. Fast forward, and these are the, the dashboard view of the vehicle in Blade Runner 2449 by a company called Territory Studio. So they, they showed me their, their designs for how do you operate the systems? What's it like? What's the interface like? Um, and there's all sorts of stuff, telemetry, there's LIDAR, there's all sorts of mapping capability within it. And then we've got things like uh, Superflux, uh, a design agency based in London. What's this new infrastructure like? What's all the layers of airspace? How are all these drones gonna work? They've got face recognition. They'll, they'll show adverts. <laughs> they'll do individually inspired adverts for each of us. Um, 
they will monitor crime. They'll report ro uh, report any misdeeds in the city. They'll monitor traffic. They'll bring media um, straight to you. So really sort of dystopian films and speculative modes have come out from this uh, mobility. Um, and it's really interesting to look at those to see where we're heading. And then we can see, actually, this is a, a simulation system. So uh, Microsoft have done a, their own um, uh, flight sim simulator. This is by a company called ANSYS. So what's it like to fly your own uh, aerial vehicle? And this is an eHang 216. And uh, so they're mapping how you move through an urban space and all the, all the dynamics, how do you mitigate noise how do you design a landing pad? <laughs> There's going to be a fundamental landscape design required for these landing pads and aerial uh, new uh, drone ports and all sorts of stuff. Uh, um, what's that experience like, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all modeled and simulated in uh, uh, by aerospace engineers. Again, going forwards, for the price of an SUV, an expensive one, and without a driving license or pilot's license, you can have one of these. This is the black fly. It lands on water. So we're going to see maybe Maybe we could say this is like Frank Lloyd Wright's vision. Remember his little penciled spinners, where you have his new mobilities across pastoral agri landscape and his new transport arteries and routes that are emerging. But how are we thinking about our spaces? Do we want this sort of vision happening? How can we use these sorts of new mobilities that are emerging and think about? The uh, application for landscape. So these are e uh, EV tools, and they're electronic. Um, who wants one of those? Thumbs down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. So you get the sort of idea uh, that's that's going on here. But actually, oh, there's a whole need for urban infrastructure control venues, control systems. So this is the EHANG control center for its fleet of aerial vehicles. You can buy them at the moment. Actually, a lot of uh, um, uh, 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 countries are already buying them. Singapore is enabling the whole infrastructure for aerial flights. And it's normally because transport has failed in other cities. So um, there was a study about perceptions of would you want your own aerial vehicle? And uh, everyone in LA and Mexico City said yes. <laughs> like <laughs> we want it because because road road systems have failed. The whole sort of infrastructure of highways is is just made cities redundant, and uh, and that mobility is 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 calling for new uh, new ways of traveling through urban uh, space. But again, let's go back to the future. 1910, <laughs> check out that aerial vehicle in the top of this, this scheme for an apartment by Eugene Hennard. Um, he says, in the near future, um, there'll be landing stages for aeroplanes. They've not arrived yet, but uh, because up to the present, the aviator has not gained sufficient mastery over his machine. But as man has at length succeeded in imitating the flight of a bird, it is by no means improbable that he will eventually succeed in imitating the flight of uh, the insect in the war of the air. So he, he, he charts H.G. Wells here um, and shows a docking bay and landing pad for um, uh, that docks into the apartment for these aerial vehicles. So that's really important. Then you've got these Uber Elevate summits happening every year where they think, OK, what are we designing? We need we need a whole new uh, uh, mobility system by architects, planners and, and landscape uh, for our cities. 
So how on earth is it going to impact our built environment? How are we going to do these things? And that's really interesting about these new mobilities. Again, another drone port in Rwanda by Norman Foster Foundation. These like new nodes and congregation points um, are, are, are coming through. And as you've probably seen yesterday, we're, we're, there's, a, there's a secret mobility in all, all, all visualizations. I love Terraform One. The, uh, the reason I love Terraform One is actually, it's not just about their designed uh, the final outcome or product, it's the way they're bringing people together from different aspects and disciplines. And I think that's really interesting. And if we're gonna think about uh, drones in the future and its impact, then we're gonna have to cross collaborate, move into a more post-disciplinary way um, to see some benefits. So mapping in US, cause I've talked a bit about this. Um, what's According the to Paul Klee. Um, Las Vegas. 1972, 1984, 1996, 2015, the false color imagery shows the proliferation of golf courses in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> Golf courses in the desert. Is that sustainable? Only mapping that's done by NASA, some obviously some of the best uh, um, uh, mapping capability in the world, and also some of the coolest people to talk to, which is really cool, um, uh, can, can sort of tell these stories. Mapping narrates space, and we're at a point of data abundance. If you played SimCity before, you've got all this data to control. So there's like a master control relationship about playing the game. And you can play this old school version from uh, 1985 in open source, but this is the same thing. That's urban planning now, that's where we're heading. Data, dashboards, management systems, um, all coming to the fore. And we're all seeing whole new data sets, night sky photography, thermal imagery, vegetation index, uh, national tree maps, um, all sorts of data. So there's a data abundance and we can derive all sorts of data and we can do really interesting things. And that was, this was from the old book from strategies, thinking about what can we do with it? Because there's so much data out there. What can we derive from it? Maybe we can make massing studies, flood models. Um, we can look at light emissions, air quality, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on. But drones offer some very particular tools and imagery uh, potentials. Line of sight planning, verified views in planning applications, heritage monitoring, looking at urban greening, mobility studies, uh, forms of responsive architecture, which you'll see, looking at tree health mapping, vegetation mapping, hazard detection, air quality, construction mon monitoring and handover, uh, um, final handover phasing and also in ecology and habitat uh, monitoring as well. We can also do loads of stuff with AI and computer vision machine learning. It's a camera in the air or it's a different type of payload. So it could be a LIDAR scanner, it could be a other sensor, but generally we're talking about cameras. So facial recognition, lip reading, crowd counting, looking at gate detection, um, uh, policing even, uh, person identification, etc. If you see, if, if you've seen a report by SWA, um, I think it's the, the, the life of urban plazas that was based on William White's 80s study. Um, they used a mounted GoPro in some of uh, some really interesting public spaces and they used machine learning counting to see where people populated in that space. So, and then they created a typology of um, people's habits. Are they like a lizard? Do they like walk to the side? Do they never enter the center? Think about when you enter campus, um, where do you go? Do you like stay to the center? Is it, do you feel like you can walk through the middle? Like, <laughs> you know, that pattern is, uh, can be detected using machine learning computer vision. 
So we can use all sorts of analytical techniques to think about what's the best design response for our, uh, our, our scheme. And that's really interesting. Uh, Carl Kuhlman's work, really uh, one of the earlier adopters of drones actually did a paper, a free one on 45, or if you've got a, a, a campus paywall to Taylor and Francis, there's a, there's a um, article called the Drone's Eye. He just showed for landscape architecture, like people talk about landscape urbanism, but I see that that's like a historical point where landscape urbanism is very reliant on the new possibilities of remote sensing satellite imagery, but actually we're getting a much better resolution and reality with our drone mapping. So it just shows a, a drone uh, a topo map and texture map in relation to the Google Earth. Yes, darling. That's very good. Do you want to show everyone while we're talking? Go on then, quick, because just, just hold it up here. Okay, that's what we've done. And come back, you're doing really well. Thank you, darling. Um, that's beautiful. She's done really well today. Um, Lego's great. Sometimes it's good to do a Lego studio. Um, Lego architecture is quite good. Get your faculty to buy it because it's he heavily expensive and um, don't do it as students. Um, anyway, back to where I was going. Carl Coleman, uh, really interesting work. You should have a look at his, his uh, a drone mapping, of quite an earlier adopter. Um, and he says that there's a that substantial agency of how individuals view, image and cognitively map their immediate landscapes. And you can see a real benefit here in drone mapping uh, potential. Um, here, uh, this is from Ohio State. So they've done a transect stud study of, uh, of, of a street for a, a transport program. They've then large format printed that across the board. And then you've got this identification. You've got a brilliant pinup to analyze the, 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 the immediate environment. It's a great consultation device. Um, uh, you've also got a 3D model to work on. So you're designing in a virtual space, but you're also, if you print out, you've got an a consultation tool as well to think about what's, what's this environment about? What's the streetscape like? What's the urban furniture? What's the sort of mobility pattern? What sort of enhancements can be made? So that's really interesting. It's immediate. Drones are democratic because they're cheap. <laughs> Um, some of you may buy them for Christmas and you may lose them over the fence. Um, ju just invest a little bit more and, uh, and, and you'll be able to, not those cheap flyaway ones, um, you'll be able to map yourself. You as students can go out and map a space and make a model of that space with some simple techniques. And that's yours rather than having to commission an aeroplane, commission a satellite or do anything uh, 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 expensive. So it brings a way of mapping for landscape architecture in a, in a very cost-effective mode, even in garden design as well. You know, garden designers can use drones to map spaces, show spaces to clients and, uh, and win work. Um, we're seeing a, a large range of urban models coming through. Uh, so this is the uh, Helsinki model, open source government commission model but it's also used drones map, drone mapping to look at the construction phases of this uh, uh, particular scheme. We also seen uh, drones in uh, virtual Helsinki. Um, so it's uh, if you use any VR, it's sustainable uh, tourism because you pop your uh, VR helmet on, you can visit virtual Helsinki, you can go and buy a coffee or buy some, some uh, uh, um, uh, um, elements and then you can and then you can leave so there's a big gamification and visualization through things like unreal unit unity engine and you can in your workflow and strategies to mapping and visualization you can go from a drone on site mapped then put into your gist model and then going out to a games engine so you can play your space you know, you can even have fun with it, put in a shotgun or whatever you want to do, just whatever computer game you're playing. Um, hopefully not those sort of uh, shoot 'em ups. Um, we can also do really interesting ana analytics here. So we can do uh, tree counting schemes about how much green space in, in certain quadrants um, are we allocating 
based on the drone mapping. So these are uh, cloud imagery, uh, um, uh, machine learning applications um, are really useful. This one's Pictera. And this is really interesting for construction sites. This is um, Skycatch. So drone, uh, because of a, a shortage in construction workers in Japan, we have automated um, ground-based autonomous vehicles being controlled by drones. So the drones are controlling the diggers, <laughs> telling them where to go, what's happening on the, uh, what sort of systems. They're doing all sorts of calculations. So the cut and fill on the top left, they're overlaying a CAD drawing, they're creating these uh, 3D meshes and point clouds. So they're becoming like the management of a construction project. Again, this is a uh, Sarawak. So they mapped the whole of this region in Malaysia within about four months <laughs> using ground-based vehicles, light aircraft and drone to co complete a complete uh, make a complete 3D model of the region. So it's crazy the, the mapping potential and the way that these systems are, are being put in in terms of urban management. Again, uh, I talked very briefly, I said uh, you can use uh, drones in responsive architecture. So this is a bit of human computer interaction here. So using uh, Pi and Adreno circuits um, and, and these drone systems, Stuttgart made a, a canopy for a park, which is responsive. So you, it follows the user's journey uh, where they situate themselves and sun themselves throughout the day. <laughs> so you've got this redeployable canopy system that just follows people, flown by drone, absolutely balmy, but actually really interesting because there are so many, there's such, there's much more sensor systems being embedded within landscape. I think it's really uh, important to sort of figure out what we're putting in, um, what's in terms of analysis, but in terms of the final re uh, realized form. Even, uh, you know, let's look at these technologies and put them together. You've got 3D printing, that's sort of had its peak and trough, uh, got in the height cycle, and you've got drones. Well, if you're Gensler, then you just do what Gensler does and just put stuff together. And uh, you've got a 3D printing drone. <laughs> so used in construction, uh, uh, the robot museum um, is going to use drones in um, Stephanie Chattel has been doing uh, temporary fabricated uh, uh, um, uh, mud shell systems. So she'd make these temporary uh, fabricated uh, biodomes with drones um, dropping mud on the, on the skin and just constantly overlaying it and that would set and uh, you've got this uh, uh, quite immediate uh, uh, fabricated uh, temporary structure. So drones can be used in all sorts of ways. This is quite, this is the scary slide, but the interesting one, this is machine learning of computer vision. So this is drones using uh, facial recognition, crowd analysis, how many people are in a crowd? You probably need uh, uh, this for your politicians. Um, uh, I know you're not as bad as the US. Uh, um, or have you got a lie detector? <laughs> So you can just, yeah, it'll just tell you, um, it'll even, even uh, um, pick up words like whether someone's just said, let's kidnap him. Like, you know, it'll even pick up gates or like body movement. So it'll pick up violence. It can really interesting. This is just the drone fl flown in the air using some arbitrary machine learning compu computer vision techniques. And this is really at the forefront of robotics and aerospace. But then I'm thinking, why? what could be done with landscape? And actually, uh, uh, companies like Airseed Technologies in Australia are using drones to for reforestation. So they have drones flying in swarms, uh, dropping uh, tree seeds, and just reforesting areas within uh, and deploying um, on uh, uh, quite remote areas extremely quickly. So you're seeing reforestation using drones in a really uh, interesting way using machine learning techniques like this. So 
you've got this data, it's crazy. Um, supplemental laser scans, you've got ground level imagery, you've got to process it, um, reality mesh meshes. It's not easy. It's This is like our near future. Um, we can do some of this stuff, but um, there's a, a term called digital twins that started to emerge with people in that smart city arena um, where you're making a real life model that mimics a virtual model that mimics the reality of, 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 of space. And I think that could be quite interesting for landscape in the future, but it's natural assets we're working with. We're, we're just the uh, cultivators in a way. So it's how do you... mimic you know the session i think that's maybe a future that we can look at uh, um uh going forward i'm sorry i may have dropped out there i'm back okay so we can do very quick mapping as well so uh this is my lockdown village <laughs> so uh with covid19 can't travel far what what am i going to do i'll give my daughter some sweets and some lego and we'll go out with the drone and do some mapping for the parish council. And so this is how quick you can just get over reality mesh. And I've done this just to show you like a very simple thing, 22 minute flight um, at 50 meters height, one centimeter resolution pixel. So one centimeter virtually in reality and um, 389 photos post process. So I always say save time in your design development for post-processing. That's where you go for a run, eat pizza or get biscuits, right? And you go to bed and leave it overnight if you're clever. And then you have like a super hot burning computer in the morning, um, but you've done your work rather than the daytime when you're productive. Um, uh, really quick to do. This is so simple uh, The you know, just uh, this was a Mavic 2. Um, uh, and then this is exported into Unreal Engine. Um, I can do GIS DWG overlay. I can put it into new products like uh, ArcGIS Urban that's that's coming out from Esri. I think this is interesting. I think there's a potential for landscape architecture. Um, I think you get like an Esri badge, like once you're in Esri, you stay in Esri. But uh, <laughs> um, I think it's quite interesting. You know, it, when we talk about innovation at the start, landscape architecture emerged from Jack Dangermond, right? This is a landscape architecture program. It's not a geographer's program. <laughs> so let's bring it back to us, uh, to, to where we started. And this is a current project at the moment, which is, should play, no, it's not gonna play. Um, I could share the link afterwards. This is exported in Unreal Engine. So it's a complete gamified uh, uh, a model of Lancaster. Um, and we've got extra data to layer up and do our macabre cake method, you know, just whatever cake we want, bit of icing, bit of jam, um, uh, just jam, <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, uh, this is an ongoing model um, going forward, but it's actually for planners and for commercial entities um, and some communal groups actually to think about uh, the urban space and what they're gonna do with it. So it's completely open source for everyone to work with. So some of the mapping and the production is removed from practice and just given to everyone to just say, look, you've got a virtual environment here to work from. And we've, uh, as a research department, we're able to do that. So um, I think uh, that's it. I'm gonna summarize, I know I've overspilled by 10 minutes, um, mainly because I've, I've had those little uh, disruptions about Lego and I've put in some terrible jokes in this lecture. Um, this is what I'm thinking about, you know, this is the reality, this is in, uh, in Indonesia. This is all our landfill and e-waste. So, you know, uh, is this the sort of space that this technology is gonna end in? Or how can we use these new mobilities, these new technologies within landscape, landscape planning and the built environment and think about the futures that are emerging. Think about the radical possibilities of mapping and its implications for practice. Think about our strategies going forward. 
think about what's what I call the hover space. So this new lower resolution height, it's only 50 meters up to 400 foot above us. And that we've got these drones that are giving us a really clear reality, a, uh, a representation of our spaces and aerial ontology. And think about the ubiquity of the tool and use it in a really beneficial way in planning and communities. So that's it. That's my ramble. Hope you've had fun. Gone 11 minutes over. Please forgive me. Thank you very much. <laughs>